Part 2. Nosology, Symptomology, and Pathogenesis of Spiritual Diseases, The Passions. Chapter 1. The Passions, Spiritual Illnesses. In turning the different faculties of his soul and body away from God, and by directing them towards sensible reality in order to seek pleasure in them, man causes the passions, also called vices, to be born in him. The fathers unanimously affirm that these passions do not form part of man's nature. Quote, they were not included in the image of God, recalls St. Basil. St. Maximus writes, quote, the passions were not created in the beginning with nature, otherwise they would belong to its definition. There are, as St. Nikita Stathatos says, absolutely foreign, in no way proper to the soul's nature. St. Isaac the Syrian likewise notes, quote, the passions come to be added on, for the soul is naturally impassable. We believe that God has made man in his image, impassable. So when the soul allows itself to enter into passionate movements, it is, as all agree, outside its nature. This is what the spiritual forebearers of the church have affirmed. The passions entered the soul as a result, and it is not right to say that they belong to the soul, even though the soul might be led by the passions. It is clear then that the soul is directed by what is exterior to it and not by what belongs to it. End of quote from ascetical homily number 82. To continue, the contranatural state of the soul is impassioned movement. This is what the great and divine Basil says. When the soul is in its natural state, it directs its life upwards. When it is outside its nature, it is below on the earth. When it is on high, it is found to be impassable, but when nature is out of its proper order, then the passions are in it. He also writes elsewhere using a strikingly medical vocabulary. Quote, again, Isaac the Syrian, it is clear that health exists in nature before the illness's eruption. If it is really so, and this is the very truth, virtue is naturally in the soul, and what follows as a result is outside of its nature. Since everyone recognizes that purity is what is natural to the soul, one must affirm that the passions do not by nature exist. For since the illness is second, it comes after health. End of quote. This last passage closely resembles a remark by Evagrius. If illness is second in relation to the soul, it is obvious that malice is second in relation to virtue. St. John Climacus affirms on his part, quote, There is neither vice nor passion in man's nature on account of nature itself, for God is not the creator of the passions. God is neither the author nor the creator of evil. Those who assert that the passions are natural to the soul are mistaken. From then on, the passions appear as the product of man's own invention, following the ancestral sin. St. Macarios teaches, quote, Through the first man's disobedience, we have received in ourselves an element alien to our nature, the malice of the passions, which having passed into habit and inveterate disposition has become our nature. St. Maximus writes the same, quote, I affirm, having learnt it from the great Gregory of Nyssa, that the passions have been introduced and, as it were, grafted into the irrational part of the soul on account of the fall outside of perfection, whereby from the moment of the transgression, man began clearly and visibly to resemble the reasonless beasts instead of bearing the blessed and divine image. End of quote. In other words, the passions are the result of man's misuse of his free will, the fruit of his personal will disassociated from his natural will in accord with God. Thus, St. Isaac writes, quote, the passions then come to be added, and the cause of this addition is in the soul itself. St. John Damascene specifies, quote, from an exact exposition of the Orthodox faith, all that God has made is very good. All that persists, such as it was created, is very good. That which voluntarily separates itself from the natural and goes against nature becomes bad. All that serves and obeys its creator and according to nature. When a creature voluntarily revolts and disobeys its creator, 
it establishes evil within itself, end of quote. We have shown that the virtues alone belong to man's nature, and it is in turning away from the virtues that man introduces the passions into himself, with the result that the passions must first be defined negatively as the absence or lack of the corresponding virtues that form the likeness of God in man. St. Dorotheus of Gaza explains it thus, quote, We have banished the virtues and introduced the passions in their place. We possess naturally the virtues that God has given us. In creating man, God placed them in him according to his word. Let us make man in our image after our likeness. After our likeness, that is, according to virtue, God then has given us the virtues with nature, but the passions are not natural. They have neither being nor substance. They resemble shadows that do not exist in themselves, but exist only through the deprivation of light. By distancing itself from the virtues through love of pleasure, the soul has brought about the birth of the passions and then established them in itself." End of quote. Saint John of Damascene teaches similarly, quote, evil is nothing other than the distancing from good, just as shadow is the absence of light. This means that if we men remain in our natural state, we are then in virtue. But if we depart from the natural state, we become contra-natural state, that is, to the vices. As we have seen, the virtues constitute man's faculties, powers, or tendencies when they function according to their nature, in other words, according to the end goal that God has assigned to them in the creation of human nature. They correspond to the normal and rational use and meaning of these faculties, which, as we have seen, is to orient and raise man up toward God. Moreover, according to the fathers, the rational means in conformity with the logos, with the word, in whose image and likeness man was made. The passions, on the other hand, are formed through the contra-natural function, that is, turned away from their normal and natural end goal, namely God, of the soul's faculties and the bodily organs, their de deviation, perversion, and misuse. St. John Damascene thus defines the passions as a voluntary deviation from what is according to nature to what is contrary to nature. St. Nikitas de Thatos likewise holds that, quote, soul's passions are aroused by the powers which go against nature. St. John Climacus writes similarly, It is we ourselves who have changed the constitu constitutive qualities of our nature into passions. St. Thalassios also speaks of the transformation of the virtues into vices, and St. Basil the Great explains, quote, We have received from God the natural tendency to do what he commands. By using these powers in a fitting and loyal manner, we live in virtue in a holy manner. By turning them away from their goal, we are led away on the contrary to evil. Such is, in fact, the definition of vice, the misuse, contrary to the Lord's commandments, of the faculties that God has given us for good. As a result, the definition of virtue is such that God demands of us the conscientious use of these faculties according to the Lord's ordinance. End of quote. From St. Basil the Great's Long Rules, number two. To continue, Dr. Larche writes, St. Gregory Palamas also teaches, the misuse of the soul's power engenders the abominable passions. And St. Maximus, who often affirms the contra-natural character of the passions, explains in the same way, nothing that exists is bad except the bad usage, the result of our mind's failure to cultivate itself in accordance with nature. In all things, the sin lies in misuse. The vices settle into the soul to the degree to which we misuse the powers, desirous, irascible, and reasoning of our soul. Evagrius also teaches this. Observing that the vices destroy the natural activities of the soul, he explains at greater length, quote, if all malice is engendered by the intellect, by the irascible power, and by the desirative power. And if it is possible for us to make use of these for good or ill, 
then it is obvious that evils come to us through the contra-natural usage of these parts of the soul. And if it is so, there is nothing that God created which is bad. Origin. Likewise notes, quote, God, the author of all things, created all the soul's movements for good. But in practice, it happens that good objects lead us to sin because we misuse them. St. Maximus can thus remark that it suffices the devil, who has focused the combat against virtue and knowledge, to overthrow the soul by the powers that are in it, by inciting man to pervert their use and reverse the direction of their exercise. Inasmuch as the passions consist of the faculties turning away from their normal divine goal and their contranatural use in the aim of obtaining sensual pleasure, they are unruly and irrational movements of the soul. St. Maximus says, quote, A passion is a movement of the soul contrary to nature as a result of an irrational love or a thoughtless aversion for any sensual object. The passions can also be rightly thought of as forms of madness, not only for this reason, but also because of all of the other disorders inherent in them and the numerous disturbances they produce within the soul. St. Athanasius of Alexandria thus speaks of men fallen into the madness of the passions. St. John Chrysostom states that the vices are nothing but madness. And elsewhere explains, quote, each of the baneful passions engendered in our soul produces a kind of drunkenness in us and darkens our reason. For drunkenness is nothing other than the wandering of the mind away from its natural paths, the deviation of reasoning and the loss of consciousness. The author of Ecclesiastes has already written, quote, I turned my mind to know the wickedness of folly. The fathers often present life in sin and the passions as a state of folly. Even more frequently, they use the term illness to designate the passions and the habitual sins proceeding from them. The Greek term for illness, meaning passion, also suggests by way of its common root of these words, meaning illness. The connection between these ideas is in practice always implicit, but the fathers many times overestablish an explicit link. St. Dorotheus of Gaza, for example, writes, quote, by the practice of evil, we take on a strange habit contrary to nature. We contract a kind of chronic illness, end of quote. The passions are the illnesses of the soul, as St. Clement of Alexandria more clearly states. St. Amonas qualifies them in like manner. St. Nikitas de Thatos speaks of the illness of the passions, as does St. Macarios. He writes, Ever since the transgression of the commandment, the soul lies fallen in the illness of the passions. God knows to which evils the soul is subject, how it is prevented from accomplishing the works of life, and how it lies plagued by the overpowering illness of the dishonorable passions. Evagrius qualifies malice opposed to virtue, and therefore considers as the whole set of the passions as a malady of the soul. St. Maximus teaches what health and illness are to the living body, virtue and vice are with relation to the soul. And St. Isaac the Syrian writes in the same way, it is the same with the things of the soul as with the things of the body. If virtue then is naturally the health of the soul, the passions are its sickness. He remarks further, quote, If it does not purify itself of the passions, the soul does not heal the sicknesses of sin. Footnote. From the ascetical homilies of Isaac the Syrian, 83 and 86, the passions are also seen to be considered as illnesses in homilies 2630 and many times over in letter 4, in which St. Isaac the Syrian writes in particular, Malice is an illness of the soul. As long as the soul is in the illness of the passions, it does not sense what is spiritual. To continue, there are many illnesses in the soul, writes Origen before going on to list examples of the various passions. These are but a few examples from all those that we shall see in the examination of each passion in what follows. 
the fathers endeavored to classify these passions, these illnesses, thus generating a true spiritual nos- nosography. St. John Cassianos explains how it is possible to distinguish and classify them with reference to the different parts of the soul or faculties that they affect, employing, employing a clear comparison with bodily sickness in making this point. He writes from conferences number 24.15, quote, There is a single source and wellspring for all the vices, but according to the nature of the part or what I might refer to as the member which has been damaged in the soul. It is called by the names of different passions and pathologies. This is also demonstrably the case, sometimes with bodily illnesses. Although they have one cause, they are nonetheless divided into different kinds of sicknesses in accordance with the nature of the members that have been affected. For when a harmful humor seizes forcibly upon the body's citadel that is the head, it produces a headache. When it gets into the ears and eyes, it becomes otalgia or amphalamia, disease. When it spreads to certain joints and to the extremities of the hands, it is called arthritis and gout. But when it gets down to the feet, its name is changed, and it is called por- poragra, a harmful humor with one and the same origin is referred to by many terms as there are parts and members that is laid hold of. Similarly, passing from the visible to invisible things, we should believe that a certain evil force inhabits the parts or what I might call the members of our soul. Since some very wise persons understand this last as having a threefold power, it must be that neither the rational nor the irascible or the desirative will be damaged by some assault. When, therefore, a harmful passion seizes forcibly upon someone in one of these dispositions, the name of the vice is also used for the pathology. End of quote. In this text, which can be considered as a representative of the father's viewpoint, the passions appear to be clearly conceived and defined as an illness, not allegorically or simply metaphorically nor by virtue of a simple comparison. Rather, as St. John Cashin himself specifies, this is done because of the true and ontological analogy present between the ailments of the body and those of the soul, which allows the former and the latter to be spoken of in identical medical terminology. In most of the cases where we shall see the fathers using vocabulary usually applied to corporal pathology, in order to describe the passions, we must recognize that it is not a matter of stylistic figures, but truly of a method of expressing of expression perfectly suited to the reality they wish to describe, precise and direct so as to tell things as they are. The analogy existing between the two orders of reality would in principle allow a description of somatic ailments in terms reversed, if there were any, for illnesses of the soul. Furthermore, if the soul's diseases are generally presented through the vocabulary of corporal pathology, this is because it is more convenient to go from the visible to the invisible than the opposite direction, particularly when instructing those who are not familiar with spiritual realities. A great number of passions and illnesses can affect the soul of fallen man inasmuch as they are pathological movements to which the different faculties are prey. Moreover, some of these movements are combined. St. John Cashin thus provides this classification as an illustration of his words cited above. Quote, if the plague of vice inf- infects the rational part, it will beget the vices of vainglory, arrogance, envy, pride, presumption, contention, and heresy. If it wounds the irascible disposition, it will bring forth rage impatience, sorrow, despair, faint-heartedness, and cruelty. If it corrupts the desirative part, it will generate gluttony, fornication, avarice, covetousness, and harmful and earthly desires. End of quote. St. John Damascene, who puts the same principle of classification to use 
in his On the Virtues and the Vices, provides a more detailed list. In another place, in the same text, he presents an even longer catalog based on the distinction between the soul's passions and those of the body. Quote, the passions of the soul are forgetfulness, negligence, and ignorance, the three vices by which the blinded eye of the soul, the noose, is subjugated to all the passions, which are impiety, false opinion, that is to say, every heresy, blasphemy, envy, anger, bitterness, rage, hatred of men, rancor, calumny, condemnation, irrational sorrow, fear, cowardice, dispute, rivalry, jealousy, vanity, pride, hypocrisy, lying, infidelity, greed, love of material things, passionate tendencies, possession of the things of the earth, despair, baseness of soul, ingratitude, murmuring, alienation, presumption, arrogance, boastfulness, love of power, man-pleasing, guile, impudence, insensibility, flattery, slight, dissimulation, duplicity, the consenting that the impassioned part of the soul gives to sins, the continual practice of these sins, the wandering of thoughts, love of self, love of money, spite, and wickedness. The passions of the body are gourmandizing, gluttony, drunkenness, lust, adultery, shamelessness, impurity, sensual delight, the love of all kinds of pleasure, the corruption of children, evil desires, and all the unspeakable passions contrary to nature, rape, sacrilege, brigandy, murder, and every license and delight of the wishes of the flesh, so as always to comfort the body further. Oracles, spells, omens, auguries, love of finery, frivolity, indolence, condemnable idleness, distractions, games of chance, the wrong and impassioned use of worldly passions, the life that loves the body. End of quote. St. Maximus the Confessor, while adopting the established classification based on the soul's three primary functions, uses a parallel classification of the passions into three other categories, those deriving from the quest for pleasure, those resulting from the avoidance of suffering, and finally those issuing from the conjunction of these two tendencies. He writes from questions to Thalassios in his preface, quote, in seeking to obtain pleasure and avoid suffering, man invents many and innumerable forms of corrupting passions. For example, if one cultivates love of self by pleasure, he arouses in himself gluttony, pride, vanity, presumption, greed, cupidity, tyranny, arrogance, ostentation, cruelty, fury, the feeling of superiority, stubbornness, contempt for others, abuse, impiety, licentiousness, prodigality, debauchery, frivolity, boastfulness, laxity, insult, outrage, prolixity, idle talking, obscenity, and every other vice of this kind. But if love of self is slain by suffering, this brings about the birth of anger, envy, hatred, hostility, rancor, outrage, gossiping, calumny, sorrow, despair, distress, the false accusation of divine providence, heedlessness, negligence, despondency, dejection, faint-heartedness, lamentation, melancholy, bitterness, jealousy, and all the others, vices due to the deprivation of pleasure. The mix of pleasure and suffering which engenders ill will and wickedness gives birth in us to hypocrisy, irony, guile, dissimulation, flattery, complacency, and all the other vices born of this mixture. End of quote. St. Maximus adds, quote, it, is, it is impossible for me to enumerate all the vices and examine the forms under which they appear. 
This list then is, is despite its length, only partial, just like the one of St. John Damascene cited previously. It constitutes a mere general survey of the innumerable host of passions which can affect fallen man. Among these various spiritual illnesses, there are some, however, that are more fundamental than others, more general and generic, if you will, this last term meaning that they somehow contain and engender all the others. The principal passions are eight in number. Evagrius gives the following classification of them. Quote, There are in all eight generic thoughts which compromise all thoughts. The first is that of gluttony. Then comes that of lust. Third is that of love of money. Fourth is that of sorrow. Fifth, that of anger. Sixth, that of despondency. Seventh, that of vainglory. And eighth, that of pride. End of quote. This catalog, fixed by Evagrius, has become traditional within Orthodox asceticism. The eight generic passions correspond to the seven nations to be conquered, plus the already conquered Egypt spoken of in Deuteronomy. The fathers at times combining pride and vainglory into a single vice only accept seven passions, thus corresponding to the seven demons spoken of in the gospel. See Matthew chapter 12 verse 45, Mark chapter 16 verse 9, Luke chapter 8 verse 2, and Luke chapter 11 verse 26. See also the book of the Revelation chapter 17 verses 3 and 9. To continue, at the source of these eight principal passions and all the other vices that flow from them is the egotistical love of self. All the passions are derived from this. But love of self is the cause of three fundamental passions that precede and engender the other five of the, of the main eight passions, and then all others. These three are gluttony, greed, and vainglory. St. Maximus writes, quote, The love of self, as I have quite often said, lies at the source of all passionate thoughts. The three generic vices of desire are in fact born of it, gluttony, greed, and vainglory. This corresponds to Evagrius' teaching, quote, on evil thoughts, of the demons who oppose praxis, action towards repentance, metania, change of direction, the first to wage war on us are those who have charge of the appetites of gluttony, those who suggest greed, and those who beckon towards human glory. All the others come afterward. He notes further, this is why the devil insinuated these three thoughts to the Savior by first suggesting that he change stones into bread, then by promising him the world if he would prostrate himself and worship him, and third by telling him that he would be glorified if he obeyed. These three primordial passions are in some way the most immediate ones those that appear first and are the most widespread in man. These are also the passions that open the door to all the others. As Evagrius notes, quote, No one falls on account of the might of a demon if he has not first been wounded by these three leaders. Moreover, we shall see that as long as man has not conquered these, he cannot be freed from the others. But when he has surmounted them, he eliminates those that remain with ease. These three passions, St. Maximus teaches, have three immediate descendants. From gluttony is born lust. From love of money, avarice. And from vainglory, pride. All the other passions come from all of these latter indiscriminately. However, let us point out that this order of production is not of absolute value. Rather, it merely indicates what generally takes place And, properly speaking, whatever passion leads to another furthers it rather than causing it. On the other hand, if it is true that one passion opens the door to another, for example, gluttony to lust, it is not the only contributing factor. Generally speaking, the classification of the passions that we have just presented cannot be limitive and exclusive. 
as we have already noted, and in any case must not be construed in a rigid and scholastic way. Besides, the fathers provide different catalogues of passions, at times in parallel fashion according to the circumstance of their teaching. Such classifications do not possess an absolute value, but constitute convenient tools for spiritual instruction and ascetical practice. We ourselves shall have recourse to them insofar as they permit an easier understanding of things and a simpler approach to the multiform and complex reality. Nonetheless, it is obvious that the, that the types of interpassionate relations that we have shown indicate only general tendencies and do not exclude other modes of generation nor other kinds of relations. The fathers also generally teach that the passions are all interrelated, implying one another and reinforcing each other. They affirm that each passion engenders all others. St. Mark the Monk writes, quote, It should not seem strange to us to be assaulted violently, not only by the thoughts that we love, but also by those we hate, to the degree that there is a wicked affinity between them. The suggestions work with our desires and vice versa. When each thought has lingered long enough on him whom it caresses, it then passes him on to the next one, with the result that he is led in a like manner by the second, without realizing it, forcibly pulled along by its relation to the first. End of quote. St. Gregory of Nyssa insists at even greater length of this interdependence of the passions which causes them to be called the same. Quote, In these vices, one somehow holds closely to another, where one has entered all the rest seems to follow, dragging each other in a natural order, just as in a chain. When you have jerked the first link, the others cannot rest, and even the link at the other end feels the motion of the first, which passes thence by virtue of their cont contiguity through the intervening links. So firmly are men's vices linked together by their very nature. When one of them has gained the mastery of a soul, the rest of the train follow. End of quote. Gregory of Nyssa on Virginity, chapter 4. To continue. Furthermore, it must be noted that the order in which the passions present themselves are engendered varies according to each person. Thus, St. John Cashin remarks, quote, The eight principal passions wage war together on the human race, but their attacks are not presented in like manner to all without distinction. Here, the spirit of lust has first place, then anger reigns. Vainglory claims the scepter of, from this person. Pride holds sovereignty over that one. And even though each of us must undergo the assaults of all, we are not tormented by them in like fashion, nor according to the same order. End of quote. As St. John Cashin points out here, it would be an illusion for fallen man to believe himself free of passion, or only of any given passion. If a certain passion seems not to be found in us, it is only that it does not appear to us or manifest itself at this time. Nevertheless, it does exist to some degree in the soul and can manifest itself at any moment if the circumstances should lend themselves to it. In any case, there is an economy of passions within the soul, such that when a passion exists with little intensity or even seems to be absent, its relative lack of is compensated by the greater development of one or several others. One can thus observe, on the contrary, that people in whom a particular passion is particularly developed are almost exempt of the other passions, or at the least they dwell in them only to a low degree. Sometimes the simple and intense activity of those engaged in business and worldly occupations in general suffices to make certain passions disappear in them. But this holds true only temporarily, for one can see the passions reappear as soon as this activity decreases in intensity. St. John Climacus cites for us an example of this process, which he himself could observe. Quote, I have seen many people in the world who by reason of cares, worries, occupations, and vigils avoided the wild desires of their body. But after entering the monastic life and in complete freedom from anxiety, 
they polluted themselves in a pitiful way by the movements of the body. End of quote from the latter, step two. To conclude, among the different passions, vainglory and pride possess to the fullest degree the capacity to make other passions disappear by taking their place. Thus, in certain cases, vainglory seems to be the enemy of gluttony. It often drives away thoughts of despair, despondency, sorrow, but also anger and lust. Pride likewise has the power to drive out of the soul all other passions and to take their place all to itself due to its being the source of all and its containing them all somehow synthetically. The proud man can thus appear to be free of all passions except pride. Pride, however, cannot itself be replaced by any other passion and remains in every man who has not been delivered from it by God. St. John Climacus writes, quote, Some of the faithful and even of the unfaithful have been deserted by all the passions except one, that is pride, and that one has been left as a paramount evil which fully takes the place of all others. End of quote. The passions are often called thoughts or passionate thoughts or carnal thoughts or wicked thoughts by the fathers since they make themselves known to man above all as thoughts. Whether these are later translated into deeds and action or not, if a man does not first sin in his mind, he will never sin in action, notes St. Maximus. He remarks further, the wrong use of our conceptual images of things is followed by the wrong use of the things themselves. Even the passions that seem to come forth from the body have in reality their source in the thoughts of the soul. St. Simeon, the new theologian, writes that everything, quote, that one generally supposes that the body seeks after is not sought by the body but the soul, which through its intermediary seeks all this. As we shall see, however, these thoughts through which the passions are primarily expressed can be at first sight unconscious and revealed only under certain conditions. The fathers also frequently call the passions evil spirits, malicious spirits, or wicked spirits, for they are inspired and maintained by the demons, manifesting the latter's great hold on man's soul. Moreover, according to the fathers, each type of thought or passion has its corresponding demon. Through each passion, the demons somehow take possession of man's soul and body and exercise a tyrannical power over them. Furthermore, the passions are designated as flesh or world. St. Isaac the Syrian thus writes, The world constitutes the universal name designating all the individual passions. When we m wish to name the passions as a whole, we call them the world. But when we wish to designate them one by one by their proper names, we call them the passions. Just as the word flesh in the patristic and Pauline vocabulary does not generally mean the body, but the passions that affect the body and soul as well as the individual passionate thoughts of the soul, so too in this context the word world does not mean creation, but the carnal comportment and care of the flesh. This latter sense of the word world is found in the following passage from St. John. From 1 John chapter 2, 15-16 Do not love the world or the things in the world. If any loves the world, love for the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. End of quote. The passions bring forth all kinds of disorders, upheavals and breakdowns in the soul. St. Gregory the Great writes, quote, As soon as a single one manages to disrupt order, there is surely another one getting ready to cause damage. And scripture is quite to the point in saying that these leaders exhort and, and the army shouts, when in fact the principal vices under whatever pretext are embedded in the deluded soul. The innumerable host of these of those who follow, drag this soul away into all kinds of madness and vex it with what can be called a bestial clamor." End of quote. He says further, 
The wretched soul that has allowed itself to be enchanted by these main vices in the grip of these proliferating sins, be it only once, becomes mad and is ravaged by a holy bestial savagery. End of quote. The passions thus produce within the soul a state of suffering comparable to the one produced by physical illnesses in the body. St. Dorotheus of Gaza thus writes, quote, If someone happens to have a melancholic body, unstable, is it not this instability that burns it, troubling it without end and tormenting its life? Likewise with the passionate soul, it does not cease to be tortured, the wretch, by its one vice-ridden habit. St. John Chrysostom also affirms that the soul suffers more through sins than does the body through infirmities. In order to heal man of the illnesses constituted by the passions, to deliver him from the madness these engender, and to relieve his suffering caused by them, in addition to keeping him safe from them, it is first of all essential to know the passions well. St. John Cassian says, unless the nature of a wound is first probed, and the first causes of a disease diagnosed, it is impossible to apply the appropriate remedy to the sufferer, nor to take proper precautions to preserve the health of the strong. End of quote. St. John Chrysostom observes the following, quote, It is the want of scripture not to be content with making known someone's fault, but to teach us at the same time the motive that led him to sin. If it does so, it is in order to preserve the health of those who are well, from similar falls. Thus doctors do when visiting the sick. Even before examining the illness, they seek out its source in order to put a stop to it at its origin. St. John Cashin continues, No sickness can be cured, no remedy prescribed for those who are suffering, unless we carefully examine and investigate the causes of the disease. St. John Climacus speaks in like manner, I would rather suggest that each of those who are sick should most carefully seek out his own particular cure. The first step in the cure should be a diagnosis of the cause of each disease. For when this is discovered, the patients will get the right cure from God's care and their spiritual physicians. St. Simeon the New Theologian teaches likewise, the monk must not only know and understand the changes and transformations that take place in his soul, but also their causes, what their nature can be, and whence they come unto him. This exacting study of the causes and origins of the passions also has a therapeutic value in itself. St. John Cashin relates that some people were healed of their spiritual illnesses by the simple act of hearing their spiritual fathers explain the different causes, forms, and manifestations of the passions' illnesses and present remedies capable of putting them to an end. He writes, quote, So this advice and much more is usually given in spiritual conferences to the young monks by their elders, who have witnessed so many falling into difficulties. Once we had recognized many of these things in ourselves as the elders instructed us and informed us, we were cured without the shame of having fallen through quietly learning both the remedies and the causes of the vices that beset us. End of quote from St. John Cassian's Institutes, Chapter 5. To conclude Chapter 1, this exhaust exhaustive and methodical description of the passions by the fathers presents itself as a true nosology and authentic medical seminology, both of which are first of all destined for the efficacious, rigorous, and methodical elaboration of the therapy for these spiritual illnesses. This therapy starts, as we have just seen, with the description, in that it allows man to place himself, to know and understand the movements of his soul, to discover their deep meaning, and to distance himself from the evil that affects him or risks striking him, to be no longer blindly determined by mechanisms of which he is unaware and which disturb and cause him suffering. Moreover, it is not only visible and easily spotted diseases that the fathers described, but also those which, although present in the heart, remain hidden to those whose spiritual discernment is not refined. The same goes for those diseases which exist only in seed, 
but which run the risk of developing, if one is not watchful. The, this nosology and seminology have here a therapeutic and also more generally speaking a preventative function. St. John Cashin explains regarding this, quote, like skillful doctors who not only treat existing diseases but also know how to prevent future ones and to take precautions with wise advice and medicine. In the same way, these true doctors of the soul treat the emerging diseases of the heart in advance with their spiritual teaching like a heavenly antidote and do not allow them to grow in the minds of the young ones, instructing them both in the causes of their present temptations and the means of curing them. Chapter 2. Self-Love Self-love is considered by many fathers as the source of all the soul's evils, the mother of all the passions, and above all, the three generic passions from which all others proceed, gluttony, greed, and vainglory. St. Maximus writes, quote, It is love of self that unquestionably engenders the madness of the three primary and fundamental thoughts. There is a form of virtuous self-love that belongs to man's nature and which Christ advises in the context of the first commandment. Quote, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, and which consists in loving oneself as a creature in the image of God and thus loving oneself in God and God in oneself. The passion of self-love is a perversion of this virtuous self-love and lies on the contrary in self-love in the primary and undiluted sense of the word, that is, in the egotistical love of oneself, in the love of the fallen self that has turned away from God towards the sensible world, which henceforth leads a carnal and no longer spiritual life. For this last reason, self-love is generally defined as a love or passion for the body and for its passionate desires. Here we must understand by body, not so much the somatic composition itself as God created it in the beginning, being subject to the soul and spiritualized, all of whose organs were directed toward God. Rather, the fallen body is meant to which the soul is subordinate and which through its senses and members becomes the primary organ of the knowledge and delight of the world considered from an exhaustively sensible perspective that is independent of God. The body, in other words, signifies here what the apostle and holy tradition generally refer to as the flesh. St. Theodore of Edessa also defines self-love further as a passionate disposition and satisfaction in accord with carnal desires. St. Nesidus Stathatos writes in the same way, Natural men, dominated by love of self, put all their care into the health and delight of the flesh. Elsewhere, he emphasizes clearly the passion's general scope. Quote, Self-love is the irrational love of the body. It leads to loving oneself, loving one's soul, loving one's body. St. Maximus explains how this process leads man from ignorance of God to self-love and from self-love to the passions as follows, quote, This ignorance completely distances man from divine knowledge so as to fill his existence with nothing but the impassioned knowledge of sensible things. Being thus freely given solely over to the emotions of the senses, after the manner of beasts, deprived of intelligence, the man distanced from spiritual and divine beauty finds, through the experience of his nature's exterior and bodily part, a creation which he raises to God's place because it responds better to his body's needs. As the body is of the same nature as the creation raised to the place of the creator, man showers his own body with love and multiple cares. Indeed, one can only worship creation by caring for one's own body. Dedicated to the corruptive service of his own body and captivated by love of self, man ceaselessly allows the passion of pleasure and suffering to develop within him, end of quote, from questions to Thalassius's prologue, St. Maximus the Confessor. To continue, self-love appears then fundamentally linked with pleasure. It is the search for carnal and sensual pleasure, a search which, as we have seen, 
is decisive in the process of man's fall in relation with the ignorance of God which reinforces self-love and is reinforced by it in return. St. Maximus further explains, quote, The more that man went after sensible things by means of his senses alone, the more ignorance of God overcame him. The more he was enslaved by the ignorance of God and the more he devoted himself to the delight of material things known through experience. The more he absorbed this delight, the more he aroused the love of self which was its consequence. The more he cultivated self-love, the more he invented various means for obtaining pleasure, the fruit and goal of self-love." At the same time as it pushes man to the ceaseless and multiform search for pleasure, self-love pushes him to avoid the suffering that inevitably follows pleasure. In response to this dual tendency, are all the passions born, according to St. Maximus. As this last point has been brought up in the previous chapters, we will only examine in what follows the other pathological effects of self-love, which St. Nicetus Stathatos considers as much as by reason of its consequences as of its nature as a great evil. Since man has no true reality save in God, he cannot truly love himself in loving himself independently of God, and is deluded in thinking he does so. St. Theophylact of Bulgaria writes, A lover of self is he who loves only himself, whence it comes about that he no longer even has love for self. End of quote. The lover of self not only does not love himself, but without knowing it hates himself. He is, as says St. Maximus, a lover of himself against himself. Because he denies God by his exhaustive love of himself, he denies in his essential being. He renounces his divine destiny, destiny and cuts himself off from the source of his true life, committing, as we have already observed, a spiritual suicide. In evoking self-love, St. Maximus writes, It is truly terrible to cause voluntarily the death of the life which we have received from God by the gift of the Holy Spirit out of love of corruptible things. Man thus ceases to practice the virtues which are correlative to his orientation toward God and opens the door to the passions, causing himself the greatest harm, since these latter introduce in him so many illnesses, so many disorders, rifts, and sufferings of all kinds. By living in self-love and its cohort of passions, says St. Maximus, men honor the very cause of their existence's annihilation, and without knowing it, they themselves pursue the cause of their corruption. Men, like wild beasts, destroy their own nature. O love of self, O universal hater, cry Evagrius, St. Theodore of Edessa and St. John Damascene, the hater of God, of oneself, but also of one's neighbor. The love of God and of oneself in God implies for man the love of one's neighbor, who, like him, bears the image of God and is likewise called to be a son of God by adoption and a God by grace. Each man is for him his fellow and brother, in whom he encounters God and rediscovers himself, or at least rediscovers another member of the same body, another part of the one human nature. By ignoring God through his self-love, man can no longer truly love his neighbor, for that which is the foundation of this love no longer appears to him, and he no longer perceives the transcendent link uniting men to one another and to himself. The lover of self provokes the division of what is united by his insanity, that is, through his not perceiving the logos, the principle of unity between what is distant, and simultaneously through his separation from him, the Theanthropos. Thus, self-love is at the source of this division that presently reigns in nature. Because of self-love, human nature crumbles away into a thousand pieces, says St. Maximus the Confessor. He writes further, Love of self is what distances us treacherously from God and from others. It is what dissected the one nature into numerous sections. Separating himself 
from others through love of self. Man tears his own members asunder. Thus St. John, the golden mouth observes, to tear one's own members apart is the act of a furious and mad man. <clears throat> the lover of self, no longer perceiving in his neighbor the foundation of his deepest reality and ceasing to be spiritually united to him, deprives himself of every authentic relationship with him. Consequently, superficial relations are introduced among men in which a reciprocal lack of comprehension, even mutual ignorance, insensitivity of people to others, and the absence of true communication hold sovereignty, all the way to situations of objective nearness, such as those in the family unit. For the lover of self, others cease to be neighbors and brothers, as being all sons of the same father and sharing in God the same nature, so as to be estranged and even worse, rivals and enemies. However, self-love opposes love for one's neighbor and leads one to hate him, since the lover of self seeks above all his own pleasure by means of the various passions that self-love engenders. Instead of aiming for the good and benefit of others, the lover of self seeks affirmation of self and his own interest. More often than not, his neighbor is only a simple means of obtaining the pleasures he seeks to obtain and thus is reduced by him to the level of an object. Likewise, he can be for him a competitor, a rival in self-affirmation and search for pleasure, and thus he directs all his aggression toward his neighbor. St. Maximus says that, quote, self-love made us turn our insensitive power against others, become savage by lovers of pleasure. The saint further notes, love of self rendered feral the tamest of natures and dissected humanity essentially one into numerous or and antagonistic or the expression is not worse mutually destructive parts in this fact also resides the division of human nature evoked above as saint maximus again remarks quote, the self-love of men has raised them up against each other hence the division of the one nature into many parts where there is the love of God, Christ is all and in all. Colossians 3.11 And there cannot be Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free man, neither male nor female. On the contrary, where self-love reigns, there one sees only oppositions, divisions, rivalries, envy, jealousy, dissensions, enmity, quarrels, aggression, all manifestations which are the fruits of this passion, as are unsociability, injustice, and the exploitation of others, and even murders and wars. Self-love appears then to be deeply pathogenic on many levels and is considered by the fathers as much in its nature as in its effect, as the mark of a man who has become mad and as itself being mad and profoundly irrational. These pathogenic effects are due to the fact that self-love is itself an illness, consisting of the contra-natural inversion of one of man's natural tendencies, the virtuous love of self, that is indissolubly linked to the love of God and the love of one's neighbor. Thus, St. Maximus writes, quote, by self-love, the devil has resolutely separated us from God and from one another. He has bent what was straight, and in this way divided nature. End of quote. In the pages that follow, we shall examine the main illnesses engendered by this first and fundamental illness. Chapter 3. Gluttony. Gluttony can be defined as the search for the pleasure of eating. In other words, the desire to eat with pleasure in mind, or rather, to find negatively in relation to the virtue whose negation gluttony is, the intemperance of mouth and belly. This passion takes two main forms. It can focus essentially on the quality of foods, and is then the search for delicate, fine, and tasty meals, and a desire that foods be prepared with care. It can also revolve primarily around 
quantity and is then the desire to eat too much. In the first case, the pleasure of the mouth and of taste is sought above all. In the second case, the pleasure of the belly or digestive organs in general. In both cases, there is the search for a certain kind of bodily pleasure, and this is why gluttony can be classified among the passions of the body. But even though the body is directly implicated, gluttony does not proceed directly from its needs. One proof of this is that the desire often surpasses the need, sometimes even by a great amount, notably in the case of bulimia. This fact allows us to consider it as a passion of the soul as well. Moreover, Evagrius calls gluttony and impassioned thought, as does St. Maximus. The body, in fact, only comes into play as an instrument that accomplishes the soul's desire. Evagrius thus writes, Those who give but scant nourishment to their bodies and yet take thought of for the flesh to satisfy its lusts have only themselves to blame and not their bodies. Gluttony is not considered a passion because of the notion that food might be impure and bad in itself, or that the very function of nutrition might involve some sin. For as Christ said, not what goes into the mouth defiles a man. Matthew 15, 11. And as the apostle teaches, for everything created by God is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving. 1 Timothy 4, 4. To detest food in and of itself as something bad would be abominable and utterly demonic, clarifies St. Diodocus of Photiki, who adds, It is in no way contrary to the principles of true knowledge to eat and drink from all that is set before you, giving thanks to God, for everything is good. This passion, then, does not consist in food itself or in the quality of it, but in a certain manner of its use, as St. Gregory the Great points out. Vice is not in food, but in how one partakes of it. This is why it is entirely possible to have fine meals without any sin, whereas it can be tainted with transgression to partake of more unrefined dishes. However, the passion does not reside in the act itself of eating, but in the presiding intention and the purpose given the act by man. Quote, in the usage of food to eat out of need and out of pleasure are one self-same action, but the sin lies in the intention, St. Dorotheus of Gaza clearly states. The passion then rests in a certain attitude of man toward food and nutrition, more precisely in his turning food and nutrition away from their natural end goal. Since God has given food to man for a precise purpose to have it serve other goals, is to pervert its use and make use of it wrongly. St. Maximus writes, The last, the the things that we eat have been created with a double goal, to nourish us and serve as a remedy. To eat for other motives is to use wrongly what God has given for our benefit. Man then respects the natural end goal of food and nutrition when he nourishes himself of necessity so as to maintain and preserve the life of his body, to guard or regain its health. But when he turns food into a means of pleasure, he makes a contra-natural use of it and the nutritive function. Gluttony, then, does not consist of the desire for food itself, but in the desire for the pleasure one can have in consuming it. This is why the abuse constituting the passion consists not only in taking nourishment beyond what is strictly necessary for the body, but also in seeking for pleasure even in what is necessary. Through gluttony, man commits sin. For in seeking after delight in food, he places the desire for food and the pleasure he takes in consuming it above the desire for God. In giving himself over to this carnal desire, he goes astray and deprives himself of the delight of the greater spiritual goods. The gluttonous attitude is basically idolatrous. St. Paul says of the men given over to this passion that their God is the belly. Philippians 3.19 The belly is a sensual God for those who are slaves to their stomach, remarks St. Gregory Palamas. Indeed, through this attitude, man sacrifices to his belly and gullet instead of to God. He turns his sense of taste and his nutritive functions into the center of his being, into what is essential to him, and is somehow reduced to them. 
He makes food an important and in some cases even a quasi-exclusive preoccupation, neglecting what above all and even exclusively ought to interest and occupy him. Man gives food the worship due God alone and shifts and transforms it to his desires whose sole object should be exclusively God. Furthermore, through the passion of gluttony, food acquires a value in itself and is used for sensual pleasure instead of being considered a gift from God and used to glorify him who created it. Herein also lies its diversion from its natural end goal, being to give thanks to God. Christ himself reveals this end purpose and shows us an example of the normal attitude when he gives thanks to the Father before distributing the bread to those around him. St. Paul also clearly affirms that God created food so that it might be received with thanksgiving and consequently advises, So, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to glorify God. 1 Corinthians 10.31 Gluttony consists of a true perversion of the essential end goal of food, which is to be consumed Eucharistically. Since in this passion, man wishes to delight in food itself apart from God, instead of delighting in food in God and delighting in God through food. By means of food, he erects a barrier between God and himself instead of utilizing them as a support in elevating himself to God. In giving thanks to God for the nourishment he has provided, man himself is hollowed, and in particular hollows the nutritive functions within him. He thus nourishes himself simultaneously on God and bread, and his food thus becomes a double source of life in him. At the same time, he consecrates the food he ingests, thereby uniting the universe to God in conformity with God's will as revealed to the first man. Gluttony, on the contrary, separates man from God and in in man creation from him. Instead of revealing God, St. Isaac speaks of him, who has behold the Lord in his own food. And being transparent to his energies, instead of serving to glorify God and deify man, food becomes, through man's sin, a stumbling block to him and to the world in encountering God. Ceasing to be a source of life, since it ceases to be linked to the source of life, through the loss of its spiritual end goal occasioned by man's perverse usage of it, food becomes, for man, a cause of death whereas he thinks to guarantee himself life by it. In light of these anthropological and theological insights, the passion of gluttony seems less banal banal, than it could have appeared at first glance. Some of the Holy Fathers, moreover, go so far as to see in the very source of the first sin. In fact, by eating of the fruit of the tree that God had forbidden him to touch, Adam desired to delight apart from God in his in this food, which in fact symbolized and represented the entire sensible world. From this first foundation, gluttony clearly shows that it causes a rupture, a separation of man from God, and signifies the loss of divine communion from man and in man for the whole cosmos. The seriousness of this passion is further revealed by the fact that it is one of the three temptations that Satan presents to Christ in the desert, Matthew chapter 4, verse 3. In withstanding him, Christ, the new Adam, reestablishes between mankind and God and consequently between the universe and the divinity the communion that the first Adam had broken. By retorting to the devil that, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Christ restores man to his true center. He does not say that man does not nourish himself on bread, but shows the necessary relationship that man must maintain with the word. He denounces the dissociations and the idolatry that sin has inaugurated and heals human nature, which had been their victim. Christ finally frees humanity from the tyranny that the devil had wielded over it by means of this passion since the ancestral sin. In all the different aspects we have mentioned, and in particular by reason of its constituting constituting a perversion of the normal and natural use of food, 
Gluttony is described by the fathers as an illness. St. John Cassian, for example, says regarding the three forms of this passion described by him, quote, There are three sources of illness, as fearsome as they are numerous. From the fathers, one can see how gluttony may be considered as a form of madness. St. Dorotheus of Gaza even uses the source of the words for gluttony and gormanizing as a support in his argument. The gluttony in the pagan authors, quote, means to rage furiously, and the enraged is called. When this illness and this madness of wishing to fill one's belly came to man, one calls it gluttony, that is, madness of the belly. But when one deals only with the pleasure of the mouth, one calls it gourmandizing, that is, madness of the throat. To continue. Not only does gluttony tyrannize man, alienating him from his desire and his delight in eating, making him unavailable for God and distancing from him from his center, it also produces numerous undesirable effects for the life of man's soul at the same time as it engenders and dangers his bodily health. The holy ascetics note, first of all, that an excess of foods or beverages, whatever they may be, deprives the mind of energy, of keenness, weighing it down and plunging it into a state of darkness, sloth, and sleep, consequences that have repercussions on the entire soul. St. Diodocus of Photiki observes, weighed down by the multitude of dishes, the body makes the mind weak, a word also meaning timid or cowardly, and slothful, a word also meaning sluggish, or slow. Such a state makes it difficult for man to ascend to spiritual realities. It prevents him from fighting the ascetical battle as he ought, makes prayer difficult, engenders negligence, and weakens him considerably. St. Isaac thus writes, He has lost half of his power, with the result that one can say that before going to the battle, he is subjugated without having fought. He is conquered by the relaxed will of the flesh, without his enemies having to put forth the slightest effort. Furthermore, such a disposition has the effect of dragging all men's faculties downward, orientating his desires in the first place toward carnal preoccupations. As St. Maximus observes, all the passions, and this one in particular, enslave the mind to material objects, pressing it, which is by nature lighter and more alive than fire, to the earth, as if by a very heavy stone were weighing down upon it. St. Gregory of Nyssa, for his part, calls to mind the man of thick thought who looks downward and notes regarding him, living but for the belly and what follows the belly, he finds himself distance from the life of God. From On Virginity. In this situation, the noose loses its capacity for discernment, being dulled, darkened, and stifled, or at the very least altered and diminished. The need to eat and the resulting drowsiness in particular prevent man from pondering the simple things of faith, notes Abba Piman. His judgment loses its keenness, becoming incapable of deep thinking. St. John Cassian notes that his mind is as though intoxicated, becomes shaky and unstable. The fathers note that the abuse of food and drink further provokes the tumult of thoughts which sullies the, th the soul. A multitude of passionate thoughts, elokismi, appear in the soul and come and taint and envelop the mind in shadow. St. Isaac the Syrian says that the effect of abusing food is an unsettled intellect that wanders the whole earth. They are impure imaginings in the filth of phantasms and the extravagance of images full of desire that traverse the soul, and in it do what they will in all impurity. End of quote, ascetical homily 26. He says further, quote, The overfull belly turns the heart into a fourfold door of del delirious phantasms. He also counsels, Do not weigh down your belly so as not to plunge your mind into confusion, and so as not to be tormented by distraction, not to cast your soul into shadow, not to trouble your thoughts. 
And St. Gregory of Nyssa explains, quote, The pleasures of eating and drinking which gorge themselves on food necessarily produce in the body by this lack of moderation, illnesses independent of our will. For satiety most often engenders such passions in man, in order then that our body might remain supremely calm and might not be troubled by any passionate movements born of being sated. One must keep watch that in every case utility and not pleasure define the measure of temperate behavior. End of quote. To conclude, gluttony thus inevitably opens the door to a flood of passions and develops them. This is why the fathers are moved to consider it as the mother of all passions and the source of all evils. St. John Climacus thus draws up a long list of this passion's progeny, described by the personalized passion. My firstborn son is a minister of fornication. The second after him is hardness of heart, and the third is sleepiness. From me proceed a sea of bad thoughts, waves of filth, depths of unknown and unnamed impurities. My daughters are laziness, talkativeness, familiarity in speech, jesting, facetiousness, contradiction, a stiff neck, obstinacy, disobedience, insensibility, captivity, conceit, audacity, love of adornment, after which follows impure prayer, wandering of thoughts, and often unexpected and sudden misfortunes, with which is closely bound despair, the most evil of all my daughters. The same saint notes elsewhere that this passion likewise has the effect of drying up the holy tears of penitence, whose utter importance we shall later see. But the main passion most immediately introduced by gluttony is lust, as we have just glimpsed in the above-cited texts. Chapter 4, Lust The passion of lust consists in man's pathological use of his sexuality. First of all, it is fitting to specify that the use of sexuality is in no way original in human nature, and only appears in mankind as a consequence of our first parents' sin. The fathers teach that Adam and Eve desired one another and came together sexually only after they had turned away from God, referring to the intimations of Holy Scripture. Thus, St. John Damascene explains, quote, Virginity was original and innate in the nature of men. In paradise, virginity was the normal state. When through transgression, death entered the world, only then did Adam know his wife and she gave birth. St. John Chrysostom teaches similarly. Adam and Eve had intercourse only after their disobedience and their exile. Previously, they lived like angels. Thus, in the order of time, virginity holds the title of priority. In the state of mankind following the original fall, virginity remains the standard for perfection. However, the use of sexuality in the context of marriage is not at all to be condemned, for it permits the perpetuation of the human race in the new state in which it finds itself and for this reason is blessed by God. The fathers, following the example of Christ, blessing the wedding at Cana by his presence as well as the apostles' teachings, recognize sexuality's total legitimacy and even proclaim its value, considering that it is called to the same sanctification as all the other functions of human existence. In the context of marriage, the passion of lust does not consist then in making use of the sexual function, but in its perverse abusive use. The notion of abuse that shows up frequently in the Father's teachings possesses a qualitative and not quantitative meaning. Here as elsewhere, it indicates a wrong use of the function under consideration, a perversion, a use contrary to its natural end goal and for this reason, contra-natural and abnormal, in other words, pathological. St. Maximus thus speaks more precisely with regard to this and other passions. Quote, it is only the misuse of things that is evil, and such misuse occurs when the intellect or noose fails to cultivate its natural powers. 
St. Isaac the Syrian develops a similar perspective when he calls to mind the passion of lust and consequently emphasizes man's responsibility in controlling his natural movements. When man is moved by desire, he is not forced to leave the limits of nature and to distance himself from his duty by the natural power. He is made to leave by what we add to nature to satisfy our own will, since everything that God made, he made in beauty and proportion. If we correctly guard the proportion imparted to us in the things we bear by nature, the natural movements cannot force us to leave the path. The body only really acts in good order. Abuse, or to be more exact, a misuse, exists when man makes use of his sexuality by thinking only of the accompanying pleasure, and when he makes pleasure the end goal of his activity in this domain. Such a name is perverse and pathological for several reasons. First of all, it denies one of the main end goals of the sexual function, the most apparent one, which is also inscribed in his very nature, procreation. Thus, St. Maximus notes that generally, vice is in the false judgment directed at representations and followed by the misuse of things. And that, for example, quote, the rule of judgment for relations with women is that they are ordained for procreation. If one's aim then is pleasure, one judges poorly, establishing as a good that which is not. And as a necessary consequence, one abuses the woman in uniting oneself to her. End of quote from Maximus the Confessor's Four Centuries on Charity, Chapter 2. To continue. However, this end goal, as essential as it may be, is neither the only one nor the most important. In the human race, procreation can seem more like a natural result of sexual union rather than its very purpose. Sexual union is, first of all, one of the modes of union between man and woman. It is one of the manifestations of their mutual love and translates this love to a certain level of their being that of the body. Love constitutes the first end goal of sexual union, as well as the many spiritual benefits man can gain from this within marriage in conjunction with the other modes of conjugal union. However, we must make clear that conjugal love is seen from the Christian perspective as the union of two persons, that is, two beings thought of in their wholeness on the one hand, and in their spiritual nature on the other, in Christ and with the kingdom in mind, a union sealed as to its nature and purpose by the grace of the Spirit conferred in the sacrament of marriage. This conception subordinates sexual union, along with all other modes of spousal union, to the spiritual dimension of their being and love. Sexual union must thus be proceeded ontologically by the spiritual union that confers meaning and value on the physical one. Only on these grounds can the end goal of sexual union be respected, as well as that of the nature of the beings brought into relation by it. When sexual union is lived independently of its spiritual context, being exercised only with the aim of the sensual pleasure that it procures, it inevitably mutilates man by profoundly perverting the normal order of his relationship to God himself and his neighbor. The exclusive desire for sexual pleasure that characterizes lust motivates man's desirative power and turns it away from God, who ought to constitute its essential goal. Obsessed with the sensual delight that his passion procures him, man is deprived of the spiritual delight of the superior goods of the kingdom. Lust like all the other passions, affects as one can see a reversal of values at the highest level. It relegates God to second place, forgetting and denying him by substituting sensual pleasure for him. In a general way, it sets the flesh before the mind in the existence of the passionate person. St. Maximus writes, quote, Desire treats the beings that are after the single and sole desirable cause and nature as more desirable than the latter, and thereby renders the flesh more valuable than the spirit, and the delight in what is visible more pleasant than the glory and radiance of the noose. End of quote. In its normal use, sanctified by the sacrament of marriage and spiritually integrated and transfigured 
by the love lived by the spouses in God, sexuality, like all other modes of union, is transparent to God. It realizes analogously, on its level, the union of Christ and the church, thus attaining a mystical meaning. On the contrary, sexual union in lust becomes an obstacle for man in his meeting with God. It ceases to be the expression of the love anchored in the spirit on a certain level, and hence a spiritual act, since it is spiritualized, thereby becoming a purely carnal act, turning in on itself and opaque to all transcendence. Pleasure taken as an end in itself becomes an absolute for man that excludes God and takes his place. Through lust, man makes an idol out of his sensual pleasure. Henceforth, man no longer sees the center of his being in the image of God, which he bears, but rather in his sexual functions. He is in a way reduced to these, just as he who is dominated by the passion of gluttony is himself reduced, as we've seen, to his digestive functions. Man is thus thrown off center and lives outside himself. He is alienated. When the sexual function is not subordinated to spiritual love as it should be, comes to occupy a disproportionate, even exclusive place in man, substituting brute and instinctive desire for love. As St. Basil of Ancria observes, man thus drags his soul along behind his body. Quote, Bodies in search of pleasure preoccupied with themselves unite the souls in them so as to put them to serving the passions that agitate them, and the souls thus follow in the wake of fleshly vices. End quote. The order of human faculties is thus turned upside down, and a profound disequilibrium is established in man insofar as his intellect, his noose, will, and, effect, and his effectivity cease to serve the mind and to be informed and directed by it so as to be enrolled in the service of sexual desire in his search for pleasure. Man governed by instinct likens himself to an animal. Through lust, many bodily functions find themselves turned away from their normal end goal in order to become instruments of sexual pleasure. The sense of sight, which plays a fundamental role in the existence of this passion, offers a particularly instructive example in regard to this. St. John Cassian shows well how the pathological character in this case flows from a contranatural use and a perversion of the perceptive faculties exercise. Quote, Sick and damaged by the trait of sexual desire is the heart that looks with, 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 looks with concupiscence, perverting the gift of sight bestowed by his creator by making it serve his wicked actions. End quote. From the Institutes. Under the influence of lust, one can say that the body finds itself turned away in its entirety from its natural end goal. Let us recall that man's body, like the soul, is called to be united with it to God through virtue, to be sanctified, deified, and glorified, and to manifest even in this world God's glory and the first fruits of the kingdom through the Spirit's transfiguring presence in him. Quote, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, which you have from God. You are not your own. You were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. End of quote. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and following. According to the Apostles' teaching, it is clear that the body's normal and natural end goal is to be consecrated to God, to glorify God, and to be a spirit bearer, just like the soul to which it is united. On the other hand, in, in affirming that the body is not meant for immortality, St. Paul plainly makes clear that man makes a contranatural and abnormal use of the body when he gives it over to this passion. By reducing his body to being an instrument of sexual pleasure, man renounces his spiritual dimension and transcendent destiny. He spurns the image of God in which he himself was made and thus becomes forgetful of human nature. He profanes what by nature is sacred and divine. He desecrates the temple of God, turning the temple of the Holy Spirit and a place of prayer into a den of thieves and making a prostitute of what along with the soul is called to be wed to Christ and the church and in marriage being an icon of this. <laughs>
the lustful man is unaware of God's will regarding the use of his body. Thus he sins against his own body and disregards God himself, inasmuch as it leads man to renounce his own nature and to reject him who gives being, meaning, and life. Lust can be considered as a source of death for man's entire being. The proceeding thoughts on the body, however, should not allow us to forget that the body does not always come into play in the passion of lust, nor the fact that most often the body is the second element to come into play. Human sexuality is mental before it is physical. Quote, the desire which is fulfilled through the body does not come from the body, quote, notes Clement of Alexandria. Most often the body is led to sin by a desire born in the heart. Mark 7.21, and developed to the point of entailing the passage into physical action. The, quote, desire of the heart appears already containing the entire passion and even fully expressing it. Yet, yet if it is true that in certain cases desire can be aroused in the soul by bodily impulses, even here it can be considered that the soul conserves the initiative either to accept the development of these impulses or to refuse their pursuit to the extent of the power at its disposal for this. At any rate, we must emphasize that the passion of lust can be exercised in thought through the delight in representations or more precisely images. St. Maximus writes, quote, As the world of the body consists of things, so the world of the intellect or noose consists of conceptual images. And as the body fornicates with the body of a woman, so the intellect forming a picture of its own body fornicates with the conceptual image of a woman. For in the mind it sees the form of its own body having intercourse with the form of a woman. For what the body acts out in the world of things, the intellect also acts out in the world of conceptual images. End quote. St. Maximus the Confessor, Four Centuries on Charity, 3.53. To continue, when the senses or the memory do not provide these representations, they can be forged by the imagination under the pressure of desire. Through the force of a particularly powerful desire, as well as by a direct demonic inspiration, this can give rise to real hallucinations. The demon of lust, Evagoras observes, causes the soul Quote, to speak and hear certain words almost as if the reality were actually present to be seen. Lust thus causes the person in whom it dwells to live in a world of phantoms and phantasms, plunging him into an unreal universe, delivering him to delirium and demonic forces. Love is the opening up to the other and the free giving of oneself. Each of the two persons united by love gives himself to the other and receives the other in exchange. In this communion, each one is enriched and blossoms in the whole extension of their being and into the divine infinity to the degree, of course, to which love is nourished by grace and finds its end goal in the kingdom and reign of God. Lust, on the contrary, is a self-loving attitude and reveals an egotistical love of self. It turns the person whom it possesses back on himself, completely closing him off to the other. It prevents every exchange, since under its influence the impassioned one has only his interests in mind, giving nothing to the other and wanting only to receive from him, and then only what corresponds to his passionate desire. He considers what he receives more as the outcome of his own desire than the other's gift. The impassioned one gives the other to himself, the other is for him but an intermediary between himself and himself. Lust thus imprisons man within himself, or more precisely and restrictively, is in the confined and closed world of his carnal sexuality, his instincts and phantasm. It completely closes him off from the infinite worlds of love and the spirit. When lust is delight in an imaginary representation of the other, this person exists neither as a person nor as a neighbor, but as a fantastical object conceived by the projection of the impassioned person's desires. Such a vision of the other cannot fail to have some impact on the way that impassioned man will be able to ponder in reality the concrete beings corresponding to his passion. 
inevitably there will be a superimposition of the imaginary upon what is real that affects a vision of the latter modified by the former. However, the vision of the other in reality is not only distorted by a preceding imagination. When the passion is exercised in direct relation to a concrete and present person, this person is reduced by it. In lust, the other is not encountered as a person and is not grasped in his spiritual dimension and fundamental reality of being a creature in God's image. He is reduced to what in his outward appearance is capable of responding to the impassioned person's desire for pleasure. He becomes for the impassioned simply an instrument of pleasure, an object. In some cases, even his in interiority is denied, as well as his entire dimension of his being, which transcends the sexual level, particularly that of the consciousness, higher affectivity, and the will. On the other hand, the impassioned person is unaware of the other's freedom insofar as his only goal is the satisfaction of his own desire, which most often presents itself to him as an absolute necessity unaware of the other's desire. As a result of all this, the other is no longer recognized, respected neither in his otherness nor in the unique character of his personal reality, both of which can be revealed in the expression of his liberty and the manifestation of the higher spheres of his being, since Human beings become practically interchangeable like objects when reduced by lust to the generic and animal dimensions of a carnal sexuality. It thus appears that under the influence of lust, man sees his neighbor as he is not and does not see him as he is. In other words, he acquires a delirious vision of those whom his passion has him encounter. Henceforth, all his relations with them are completely perverted. The pathological and pathogenic character of lust is sufficiently apparent to us on a different levels so that we may understand well that the fathers frequently qualify it as an illness and see it as a form of madness. St. Basil writes, quote, Desire is a sickness of the soul, evoking in particular what is at work in this passion. Quote, the heart that looks with desire is sick and wounded by passion says St. John Cashin, and elsewhere describes the same passion as, quote, pernicious illness, or languor, or just illness, and speaks of the mind made ill by its attacks. St. Gregory speaks of, quote, the illness of pleasure. In his designation of this passion, St. John the Golden Mouth, who, like St. John Cashin, calls it pernicious illness, says additionally, quote, it is an off Ophlamalia, much worse than lust, an affliction not of the eyes of the body, but of the soul. Lust is even more often considered as a form of madness. St. Basil sees in the manifestation of this passion, passion, quote, the works of a frenetic and distracted soul. See St. Basil's homily on th that one must not be attached to the things of this world. To continue, and St. John Climacus writes, quote, The sufferer of this passion is like someone out of his mind and in a trance, perpetually drunk with desire for creatures. The same saint says further, quote, The demon of fornication, after darkening our mind which governs us, often urges and disposes us to do in the presence of people what only those who are out of their minds do, end of quote. St. John Chrysostom attempts to show how this passion leads man's reason astray and darkens and agitates and devastates and obsesses his soul. Quote from homily on 1 Corinthians chapter 11. As clouds and fog envelop the bodily eyes, so too when the impure passion has taken hold of the soul, it takes from it the faculty of foresight and does not permit it to see anything beyond the present object. But tyrannized by these temptations, the soul is easily subjugated by sin. It has but one object before its eyes, in mind and in thought. And just as the blind, standing upright in the open air at noon, receive no light from the sun since their eyes are closed, so too the wretched ones plagued by this illness close their ears to the numerous and salutary teachings that resound all around them 
End of quote. The same saint in another place describes the sensual delight at which lust aims as, quote, the mother of madness. The patristic teaching on lust, as we have already been able to observe in the extracts presented above, show three main outstanding pathological effects of this passion, quote, a disturbance and agitation of the soul, which accompany the exercise of the passion from the birth of the desire until its assuagement, a restlessness accompanying the passion from the beginning in the search for its object and in the elaboration of the means permitting its attainment, along with all this implies particularly uncertainty, the anxious awaiting of this or the fear of lacking it. Likewise, a restlessness that follows the satisfaction of the desire. The pleasure disappears almost as soon as it appears, leaving behind in the soul a taste all the more bitter, since man has made of it an absolute and expected a, fu a full and complete satisfaction. From that point on, the impassioned person experiences a feeling of frustration accompanied by anxiety and sometimes even anguish. Under the influence of his passion, he believes he can remedy his state of suffering by the renewal of pleasure. Thus, the desire barely satisfied is born anew with all its anxieties. This restlessness increasingly grows as the exercise of the passion maintains and reinforces the power of the desire expressing it. At the same time, desire increases the importance given to pleasure, which only makes more painful the difficulties that are inevitably encountered in renewing the satisfaction of desire as often as the passion demands, as well as the dis disappointment resulting from the discrepancy between the impassioned person's expectation of pleasure and what it actually attained. A darkening of the noose, of the mind, of the intellect, of the conscience, and a loss of discernment. Besides the th these three main effects, the passion of lust also has the consequence of numbing the mind and weighing down the soul. By reason of its extraordinary power, it wields a truer tyranny over those whom it possesses than any other passion. St. Gregory of Nyssa writes, Among the numerous passions which assail the human heart, none bears a might against us comparable to that of the frenzy of sensual delight. For this reason, it is a difficult enemy to combat and repulse, but also because of the surprising speed of the demonic action inspiring it. Like all the other passions, lust destroys the virtues. Correlatively, it engenders in the soul all sorts of depraved attitudes, particularly the absence of the fear of God, the loathing of prayer, the love of self, insensibility, attachment to this world, and despair. Let us note in conclusion that three types of passionate behaviors contribute primarily to the birth and subs subsistive or development of the passion of lust, pride, and vainglory, judging one's neighbor, and the abundance of food and of sleep. End of chapter 4. Chapter 5. Love of Money and greed. Generally speaking, love of money means an attachment to money and the diverse forms of material wealth. This attachment is manifested in the delight experienced in its possession, the care in keeping it, the difficulty experienced in separating oneself from it, and the pain felt when one makes a gift of it. Greed consists essentially in the will to acquire new goods and the desire to possess more. While the word is usually translated as avarice, this notion nonetheless needed to be understood in a broader sense than how it is usually nowadays. Greed in the original Greek is generally translated by desire, greed, cupidity, or avidity. Although they represent two different passionate attitudes, love of money and greed can be studied together insofar as they both proceed from the same attachment to material goods and most often in reality go hand in hand the one usually implying the other. It is important to remark here, as we did in the preceding chapters, that the cause of these passions is neither money nor material goods themselves, but rather man's perverse attitude toward them. The end goal of money and material goods is to be used by man so as to satisfy his needs relative to his substance. The greedy and avicious av 
do not respect this end goal and adopt with respect to them a pathological attitude by conferring upon them an intrinsic rather than utilitarian value and delighting not in their use but in their possession. St. Maximus equally emphasizes on this topic that nothing created by God is evil and that the passion is due to the wrong use we make of our soul's powers. In this instance, the desirative power. Thus, St. Maximus says, that which is evil is not money, but avarice. Nothing among creatures is evil except misuse, which comes from the mind's neglecting to cultivate itself as nature demands. The pathological character of greed and the love of money are constituted fundamentally by this misuse of the desirative faculty, as well as of all the other faculties implicated by these passions. But this misuse is not only defined in relation to material goods, more fundamentally it is defined in relation to God, implicating in addition the relationships of man to himself and to his neighbor. Although man in his original state placed all his desire in God and endeavored to conserve the spiritual riches received from him, seeking to acquire new spiritual riches and conforming in all this to the natural end goal of his desirative faculty. In the case of these passions, he turns his desire away from this normal end goal in order to turn it toward material goods alone. He uses it contrary to nature in order to acquire and keep them. The love for God and the attachment to spiritual goods on the one hand, and the love of money and the attachment to material goods on the other, are founded on the same desire to faculty of man. This is why they are incompatible and mutually exclusive, as Christ himself teaches. Quote, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Luke chapter 16, verse 13, and Matthew 6, 24. To continue, man distances himself all the more from God because he becomes attached to money and shows himself to be greedy for material riches. As St. John Chrysostom notes, quote, This love, victorious over every other love, drives from the soul all other desire. St. Nikita Stathatos writes the following on this subject. Greed impels men to love money more than they love Christ, to esteem what is material more highly than God, to worship creation rather than the Creator. And if you aspire to friendship with Christ, you will hate money and the gluttonous love of money. For money lures towards itself the mind of whoever loves it and diverts it from love for Jesus. End of quote from centuries. Thus, money and the diverse forms of wealth occupy the place due to God in the life of the greedy and avicious, avicious man, becoming idols for him. St. Paul affirms that covetousness is idolatry, and one who is covetous is an idolater. And the fathers state this as well. The victim of these passions is certainly unaware of his idolatrous attitude, and if from an exterior point of view, and formally speaking, he does not worship riches, as do idolaters their idols in the context of an established religion, he basically has the same attitude as they, the same devotion. He accords these passions the same importance, yea, the same sacredness. He gives them the same attention pays the same respect and shows the same veneration as do idolaters toward their idols. If he does not offer them material sacrifices, he consecrates much more to them by expending all his energy, power, and time on them. He immortalizes his soul to them. Even if love of money and greed are not sufficiently developed so as to exclude God totally, they reveal a lack of faith and hope in him. On the one hand, man demonstrates by these attitudes that he puts his trust in money more than in God and is preoccupied with acquiring goods, trusting only in himself, whereas God provides this to those who ask it of him with faith. On the other hand, man pretends by this to foresee and guarantee and thus somehow to master a future which in fact does not belong to him and draws up vain projects instead of giving himself over in all things to the divine will. Thenceforth he ceases to see in God his sole refuge, and consequently to evoke his aid. Rather, 
he has an illusory impression of independence and of absolute mastery over his existence. Thus, he cuts himself off from God. The pathological character of love of money and greed is likewise and consequently made manifest in the relationship of man to himself. Subject to these two passions, he lacks the most basic love with regard to himself. He prefers money and material riches to his own soul. Preoccupied with keeping the goods he possesses and acquiring new ones, he neither takes care for his soul nor does he worry about his salvation. St. John Cashin says that he neglects the image and likeness of God, which he should preserve without stain in himself by worshiping God. Quote, Indeed, one cannot love both one's soul and money. St. John Chrysostom homilies on 1 Corinthians. Occupied with increasing and maintaining material wealth, man cannot develop his spiritual potentialities and affect the blossoming of his nature, his hypostasis and persona, and thus he keeps himself enclosed within the limits of the fallen world. Even though he believes that he truly enriches himself, that he gains his freedom and guarantees himself life in gathering treasures on earth, he alienates and pins down all his being and existence to this world and the flesh. For where man's treasure is, there his heart is also. He thus turns his back on the only real riches coming from God, depriving himself of the treasures and life of the kingdom, dooming himself to spiritual poverty, and losing his life instead of gaining it. Although he thinks to find happiness in the pleasure he experiences in acquiring and possessing, he condemns himself to dissatisfaction and finally to misfortune, since this pleasure is unstable, imperfect, transitory, and ends sooner or later. Above all, it takes the place of spiritual delights, which are incomparably superior and alone capable of fully satisfying man, whom pleasure in the end deprives of eternal bliss. Thus, it is clearly apparent that man in many ways becomes his own enemy, as St. John Chrysostom says, through love of money and greed. However, Man's relationship with his neighbor are also seriously disturbed by these two passions. According to the fathers, the acquisition of riches is always to the detriment of others. He who possesses them appropriates to himself goods which do not in the least belong to him, and deprives his neighbor of the money or things he possesses in greater measure than does his neighbor. Thus St. John Chrysostom can proclaim that, quote, the rich and the greedy are thieves, of a certain kind. Commentary on Lazarus and commentary on homilies, uh, 1 Corinthians. To continue, and St. Basil considers them in unveiled terms as despoilers and usurpers. All men are indeed equal. They all have the same nature. They all are made in the image of God. They are all saved by Christ. Without any exception, God has given the goods of this world as an endowment to all men, that they may delight in them in equal fashion. The fact that some acquire and possess more than others contradicts the equality willed by God in the distribution of goods and institutes an abnormal and non-natural state. Such a state did not exist in the beginning. It has appeared as a consequence of the ancestral sin and has been maintained and developed due to the passions, and particularly those of love of money and greed. In truth, things belong to all as regards their use and delight, but they belong to no one as regards property. One must use wealth as a steward, not as a sensualist, writes St. Basil. The fathers emphasize that wealth is meant to be shared and divided up equitably. The greedy and miserly show contempt for this end goal, the one by seeking and accumulating goods with only his own personal pleasure in mind, and the other by egotistically holding on to his money. Both of these exceed the limit of what is lawful. In doing so, for they think more of themselves than of their neighbor and contradict the basic precept of charity, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Evagrius says, it is impossible for charity to exist in someone with wealth. The greedy and the miserly, always aiming at an egotistical pleasure, no longer look toward their neighbor, 
they cease to regard him as an equal and brother. They reject him who shares their nature, notes St. Ambrose. They exclude and deprive their neighbor of the dignity conferred upon him by God, refusing to rank him among their companions, as St. John Chrysostom observes. Love of money and greed further destroy charity and pervert relationships with others by leading him whom they possess to see in his neighbor nothing more than an obstacle to the preservation of possessed riches or a means to acquire new ones. St. John Chrysostom also notes that love of money brings a universal hatred and makes us detest everyone, the victims of injustice and even those whom our injustices have not trampled down. The lover of money incites hatred, but is himself full of hatred with respect to others under the influence of his passion. When they do not engender insensibility vis-a-vis one's neighbor, love of money and greed give birth to an aversion to other men and even make the one they possess pitiless and cruel. These passions constantly provoke arguments and disputes, negotiations. St. John Chrysostom observes, quote, In riches there is nothing but causes of affliction, divisions, quarrels, snares, hatreds, and fears. St. John Climacus writes that the love of money produces hatred, thefts, envy, separations, enmities, storms, remembrances of wrongs, hard-heartedness, murders. This passion is even the source of wars. As for greed, St. Gregory of Nyssa remarks that it unleashes in men either anger with his kith or, and kin, or pride toward his inferiors, or even of those above him. Then hypocrisy comes in after this envy, a soured temper after that, a misanthropic spirit after that. Love of money and greed can go so far as to render man totally inhuman, making him like a savage and ferocious beast. And those who are profoundly afflicted by these passions, writes St. Gregory of Nyssa, everything happens as though they had changed their nature and lost all the characteristics of their species so as to turn into monsters. For all these reasons, the fathers affirm that love of money and greed constitute true illness of the soul. They insist on the fact that each of these, already serious in itself from the beginning, becomes particularly formidable, since it is practically incurable if one allows it to develop and take root within oneself. St. John Chrysostom warns, quote, If we do not stop this passion from the beginning, once it has entered, it strikes us with an illness that can no longer be healed. St. John Cashin affirms the same. If we are unwary and once let it into our hearts, it proves most dangerous and most difficult to eliminate. St. Nilsorsky teaches similarly. If this disease becomes rooted in us, it becomes the most evil of all vices. In similar manner, the fathers do not hesitate to see in these two forms, these two passions, rather, forms of madness. Love of money and greed are insatiable in their basic character. This allows one to understand an important part of their pathogenesis. The fathers frequently show that these passions tend to develop more and more, never having a definitive goal and never being satisfied by the objects to which they are attached. Not only is the desire underlying them exercised indefinitely, but also it progressively increases the more it is made manifest and is actualized. For St. John Chrysostom, love of money and greed are a bulimia of the soul. He writes, quote, from his homilies on 2 Timothy chapter 7. There is no illness crueler than the incessant hunger that doctors call bulimia. No matter how much one eats, nothing can alleviate it. Transfer such an illness from the body to the soul, what is more frightful? The bulimia of the soul is avarice. The more it gorges on food, the more it desires. It always stretches out its wishes beyond what it possesses, end of quote. Moreover, this insatiability strikes rich and poor alike. Subject to this passion, the poor envy the rich, but the rich envy those who are yet richer than they. For as St. Ambrose notes, 
Every being that possesses an abundance thinks itself still too poor. This insatiability reveals the tyrannical character of love of money and greed, which turn man into a slave of the things he has, link him to the wealth he possesses or covets, and lead him into the endless race of seeking out new acquisitions. They subordinate all men's faculties to their purposes and objects and enslave him to the devil more than all other passions. Love of money and greed deprive man of his liberty, literally alienating him. Within the soul, for all the reasons mentioned above, the never-sated desire to possess more, as well as that of keeping what one has, provoke a continual maelstrom of unrest and permanent upheaval. St. John Chrysostom writes that for those who are affected by love of money and greed, there is never tranquility, never security for their soul. Neither night nor day brings them any appeasement, rather they are tormented everywhere. First of all, love of money and greed engender a state of fear, anxiety, or even anguish in the soul. St. Gregory the Great thus describes the interior state of the greedy and covetous man, quote, when he has embraced a lot of things in his avarice, even his repletion oppresses him. Although his sole anxiety is to seek how he will keep what he has acquired, this safety causes him anguish. The first pain he feels is the upset caused by the question that his inordinate desires poses him, how to get what he wishes. Then once these desires are fulfilled, Another grief arises, the worry about preserving everything he has gained with such effort. He is thus overwhelmed by all sorts of sorrows, which are the chastisement here below for his covetousness and care for safeguarding what he possesses. End of quote. St. John, the Golden Mouth, makes a similar description of men subject to these passions. Quote, they are always agitated and their soul has no rest whatsoever. The eagerness to acquire what they do not already have makes them regard as nothing what they already have. On the one hand, they tremble in the apprehension of losing what they have already amassed. On the other, they work in order to acquire new things, that is, new subjects of fear. The covetous man's anxiety can also apply to his constant will to buy or to sell at the best price to his feeling of having made a bad transaction, to the fear of seeing what he possesses not be valued at the price he attributes to it. This anxiety can obviously be furthermore a consequence of the involuntary loss of the goods to which he is attached. Added to this anxiety is another basic pathological effect, sadness, the depressive state of the soul. The state most often results from the thwarting of the desire to possess more, the correlative feeling of not having enough, or further from the idea that one risks losing what one possesses as though the loss were actual. Since, as we have seen, the desire to acquire knows no definitive satisfaction, the sadness linked to the failure to quench its thirst to possess is continuous, just like what the covetous man feels when he fears being stripped of all he has to the degree that the risk of losing what one has is permanent. In addition, writes St. John Climacus, waves never leave the sea, nor do anger and grief leave the avaricious. Generally speaking, therefore, the rich man is far from taking as much pleasure as one might think from his possessions. Quote, where is the pleasure and rest of the spirit that one finds in wealth, asks St. John Chrysostom. He replies, As for me, I avow that I see there nothing but subjects of affliction and misery, and a sorrow which gives no respite whatsoever. Elsewhere he observes that the greedy man finds himself all his days overcome by new worries, yet he protests that life depends on him. He is incapable of delighting in what he loves. The greedy are deprived of delighting in what they have, not only in that they dare not make use of it at will, but also in that they are never satisfied with it and always thirst for more. What could be more sad? The saint affirms the attachment that lovers of money have to their riches is not proof of the satisfaction they find in them, but rather of the sickness and disorder of their mind. 
The covetous man's anxiety and sadness can obviously be translated simultaneously into a somatic as well as mental pathology. Love of money and greed and gender and reveal yet other disorders, some of which affect in particular man's vision of reality and his relationship to it. Love of money, like all other passions, casts a dark pall over the soul and darkens the noose. The avicious man lives in the shadows and he spreads out a thick night over the world he sees. For him the soul's sight is extinguished, observes St. John Chrysostom, who says further, avarice is a terrible scourge. It closes the eyes and shuts the ears of him who is possessed by it. Consequently, the covetous man has a radically distorted vision of reality. St. John Chrysostom notes again, Avarice is a kind of night which obscures all things, or rather shows them other than how they are in themselves. He affirms elsewhere that love of money gives birth to delirium. This delirious vision of reality is first of all manifested in how one considers one's neighbor, who indeed ceases to be perceived in his true reality as a person in God's image, so as to be regarded exclusively through the prism of interest and reduced to a means of enrichment and financial value. In short, in all cases reduced to an object. Avarice does not permit whom him who it possesses to pay any attention or give any consideration to anyone at all, remarks St. John Chrysostom. He observes for the, for the avaricious, men are not men. The incoherent character of the greedy man's perception of reality is likewise revealed in how he regards the object of wealth themselves. He who is attached to the various material goods making up wealth accords these goods in importance and value beyond what they have in reality, consequently paying more attention to them than they really deserve. The fathers often recall that gold or precious stones, for example, are in fact nothing but simple stones, earth, and it is by means of a sort of illusion and delirium that men can attribute another value to them and consider them differently. The same applies to all other riches, on the contrary, as St. Simeon, the new theologian, shows us, quote, he who has either preserved from the beginning or recalled and recovered the image and likeness of God has likewise received the faculty of seeing according to nature. He sees all things as they are by nature. He sees gold and far from being attached to its gleam, considers that this matter comes from the earth and is nothing but dust or stone and it can never be changed into anything else. He sees silver, pearls, all the precious stones, and far from having his senses captivated by their enchantment, sees in all this nothing but stones like the others, and everything in the same way appears to him as mud. He sees luxurious vestments, and far from admiring their embroidery, considers that they are the excrement of worms, and he pities those who take pleasure in them and seek after them like precious things. End of quote. The man attached to riches is likewise delirious in that he in fact accords them an absolute value, considering them to be long-lasting, even eternal, although they are all perishable and destructible. Allowing themselves to be deceived and being obsessed with the sensual pleasure pertaining to their passion, the lover of money and the greedy man live thenceforth unaware of the true goods, the authentically absolute and eternal riches. St. Gregory Nazazine remarks, quote, Despite all its precariousness, we hold on to prosperity here below with such frenzy, and we allow ourselves to be misled by these deceitful joys to the point that we can no longer imagine anything stronger or greater than temporal goods. He recalls, our goods here are fugitive and transitory, and as in the game of dice, they pass from hand to hand, and there is nothing we really possess. Calling man to a healthy vision, he exclaims, Who will flee from these futile goods? Who will regard the present goods as null and void? Who will discern the reality of their appearance? Who will know how to distinguish falsehood from truth? The avicious man thus appears as swapping the present for eternity, 
the perishable for the immortal, the visible for the invisible, the true goods of the kingdom, the heavenly treasure, the pearl of great price for illusory goods, the false riches of this world. They are indeed miserable, says St. John Chrysostom, of lovers of money. For exchanging heaven for a piece of earth and mud, they are like a king who, having traded his kingdom for a dung heap, would revel in this exchange, as if this heap of manure were worth more than his crown. And he notes elsewhere with regard to those who are stricken with the same passion. Those who live in the shadow of insanity no longer recognize the true nature of things. They roll about in filth, and the dung heap ceases to appear such to them. Possessed by avarice, they are insensible to the bad odor it exhales. He observes further that the covetous man is the victim of an illusion in the same way that he who in darkness mistakes a rope for a serpent or his friends for enemies. It is clear that love of money engenders for him true delirium. This delirium, moreover, is found again in the fear that the covetous man experiences at the idea of losing what he possesses, as well as in the accompanying sadness. These indeed are not objectively motivated, but proceed from false beliefs, having their source uniquely in the impassioned person's disordered soul. St. John Chrysostom also shows this. Quote, a good number of men judge things here below poorly, and also fall into discouragement. Thus the matter frightened at what is not frightening, dread things that do not exist at all, and flee from shadows. It is typical of them to fear a loss of money. This fear is not imputable to nature but to the will. If there were if there were the, there a real cause of affliction, all those who suffer losses would necessarily be unhappy. But the same misadventure does not produce the same affliction in us. It follows that the origin of the affliction is not at all in the nature of things, but in the coarseness of our thoughts. <clears throat> Dr. Larcher continues, Delirium is likewise found again in another pathological feature of the love of money the obsessive and quasi-hallucinatory character it confers on money and material riches in the mind of the one in whom it dwells. This person, permanently menaced, menaced by the thought of the goods he possesses or seeks to acquire, sees everything through them and thus deforms the reality he perceives. St. Basil says to the Avisurus, 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 You see everywhere nothing but your gold. You imagine it everywhere. Gold dominates your dreams at night and haunts you by day. The mad do not see the real world but the hallucinations of their confused brain. Similarly, your soul, plagued by its obsession, sees everything in gold, everything in silver. End of quote. St. John Chrysostom notes analogously that the man stricken with the love of money or greed under the influence of its insatiable desire goes so far as to want things that do not exist and transports himself into a fantastical and hallucinatory world. The pathological character of the love of money and of greed is further revealed in the multiple passions and illnesses they engender. Following St. Paul, the fathers affirm that love of money is the root and mother of all evils. Thus, St. Nikitas Stathatos asks, if this disease is so evil that it can be called a second idolatry, what exorbitance of evil will the soul willingly sick with such a disease not surpass? As we have shown, love of money and greed destroy charity. They give birth, consequently, to all the passions that are contrary to it. Insensibility, aversion, hatred, enmity, resentments, the spirit of argument and quarreling, crimes, etc. We have also seen that these two passions produce fear and sadness. We must note that they can also engender within the soul anger and various forms of violence, but also sloth, pride, vanity, and the concomitants of these latter two passions. Their offspring, self-confidence, the spirit of superiority, disdain for one's neighbor, disrespect, insolence, and arrogance. Let us note in closing what furthers 
the development of love of money and greed. St. Maximus teaches, There are three reasons for love of money, love of pleasure, vainglory, and lack of faith and confidence. Lack of faith is worse than the other two. St. John Chrysostom, on his part, gives the following reasons, quote, To want to gain the upper hand over other people in the possession of carnal goods has no other origin than the growing cold of charity. Cupidity has no other source than pride, the hatred of men, and disdain. <laughs>